Hello, how's it going? It's Monday, so we're doing a Chronicle Volume 3 video. In today's video, I'll be covering the invasion of Nomragan, Eye of the Storm, and the Path of the Damned. So let's go! Although the gnomes had sent weapons and war machines to Lordaeron to assist in the fighting against the Scourge, they hadn't sent many gnome soldiers, and some members of the Alliance were thinking maybe the gnomes weren't all that loyal after all. But what they didn't know was that Gnomeregan had its own bloody problems to worry about. It was currently under siege, not by the Scourge, but by Trogs. The reason the Trogs had resurfaced after all this time was actually kind of the Dwarves' fault. Explorers from Ironforge had delved deep into Alderman in search of artifacts and knowledge, and they'd inadvertently woke the monsters up. The Trogs slaughtered pretty much all of the explorers, but some did escape. They scrambled back to the surface and cheesed it back to Ironforge, relieved that the Trogs hadn't followed them. Unfortunately, they didn't know that the Trogs weren't hunting them on the surface. They were hunting them from below. As the Trogs carved out their underground tunnels towards Ironforge, they noticed strange noises, something artificial, the churning of machines and the grinding of gears. So they decided to check that out instead, and they eventually breached the lowest levels of Gnomeregan. The Gnomes were no match for the Trogs physically, Trogs were bigger, but gnomes were smarter. Their leader, I Tinker Gelbin Mechatork, didn't allow fear or anger to overwhelm him. He remained calm and used his bloody noggin. He stationed soldiers and war machines at choke points to hold the invaders at bay. However, that didn't really work fantastically well because the Trogs would just borrow round them. This wasn't looking good for the gnomes. Mechatork briefly thought about calling on the Alliance for help, but reconsidered. Protecting Lordaeron was a much bigger priority, and he didn't want to divert any resources from that front. In fact, he considered the Northern Campaign so important he didn't even bloody tell them about the gnomes' problems at all. It would be years before the world learned of the sacrifices the gnomes had made in the name of the Alliance. But enough of that. The Alliance itself had a pretty big problem. Lordaeron had fallen. The Burning Legion could now gather its forces in the Eastern Kingdoms, cross the Great Sea, and seize the Second Well of Eternity. Kil'jaeden had done his part, but it would be Archimonde, the Defiler, that would lead this invasion. Which makes sense. Kil'jaeden is more of a secret squirrel, whereas Archimonde is more of a, like, a balls-to-the-wall, in-your-face squirrel. Archimonde handpicked demons to join his assault force. He picked mostly folks who'd waged war on Azeroth before, but he couldn't take a lot of demons with him. There wasn't a way to create a portal powerful enough to bring the full might of the Legion until they'd taken the Second Well of Eternity. Even transporting Archimonde to the world was a big ask. They needed someone on Azeroth to open the portal for them. The Lich King learned of this predicament and proposed to the Dreadlords that they should try and get hold of an artifact called the Book of Medivh. Many years ago, Medivh had infused some of his guardian powers into the book, as well as recorded notes on stuff like the Dark Portal. This book would probably be sufficient enough to bring Archimond and his vanguard to Azeroth. One problem though, it's currently under lock and key in Dalaran. Getting this book wasn't going to be easy, but the Lich King was just full of ideas and helpful solutions. If the Scourge were to resurrect Kel'Thuzad, for example, he'd be able to bypass the city's defences and obtain the book. The Dreadlords were pleased with this plan and were like, Good job, mate. Little did they know, the Lich King had his own agenda. Kel'Thuzad was one of the few servants he could trust. Having him back would be great when the time came to rebel against the Legion. The responsibility of recovering Kel'Thuzad's remains fell to its killer, Arthas. Arthas didn't really have any issue with this. He's a good little servant boy by this point. He rallied a force of undead and marched on Anderhall. Uther the Lightbringer and his paladins used the city as a headquarters where they'd launch counterattacks against the Scourge. Arthas wasn't bothered. He viewed the paladins as easy prey. He stormed in and cut down the Holy Warriors. But Uther held his own against the Death Knight. In fact, at one point, he bested him in combat. As Arthas lay on the ground, all Uther needed to do was strike out with his light-infused hammer, and that would have been it. But he wasn't quick enough. Arthas recovered, repeatedly hit Uther, and then plunged Frostmorn into his old mentor's heart. As he watched Uther die, he felt nothing. The resistance in Anderhall ended, and the city fell under Scourge control. Kel'Thuzad's remains were collected, and Arthur set out for the next leg of his journey. The Lich King had also convinced the Dreadlords that they could not only resurrect Kel'Thuzad, but transform him into a Lich and the Dreadlords thought that was a fantastic idea. To do this, they'd need a potent source of arcane energy, and luckily, there just so happens to be one of those in Kel'Thalas, the Sunwell. However, this fount of arcane energy was everything to the High Elves. They'll probably fight to the last to protect it, but it's all right, Arthas will probably fight to the last to take it. And we're leaving it there. Good guys really need to start pulling their fingers out soon. The bad guys seem to be doing all of the winning at the moment. In the next video, the bad guys continue to win, but we'll see Sylvanas introduced. So that's probably exciting. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, blah blah blah. But all that's left to say is, thanks very much for watching, and see ya!